Thank you very much, and I want to thank Holly for inviting me to this conference and everyone for putting it on. It's a wonderful conference and sobering in many ways. And after hearing the last few talks, especially from Liz Pellegrino and, and Michael Udell, um, a little apprehensive coming up here as a researcher doing early detection and risk detection research, but um, I'll do my best to, to give you some faith in what I'm doing. So I have to say, I'm going to be talking about a specific bioethical dilemma that arose in a research study that is ongoing at Marcus, and it's an Autism Center of Excellence grant, so this is the work of many, many colleagues. Um, most importantly, the investigators, uh, Ami Klin, who's sitting back there, um, my colleagues Warren Jones and Gordon Ramsey at Emory, and then Amy Weatherby at Florida State University, who is actually the principal investigator on the treatment that I'm going to be talking about. I am a clinician scientist, so clinician comes first and foremost. I specialize in the diagnostic evaluation and early detection of, of infants and toddlers at risk for autism. And so when I say a clinician first and foremost, the needs of the individual and the family come first and foremost far before the science. And so we treat every single case that we're conducting for research as a clinical case. I oversee a team of 15 licensed psychologists and speech pathologists who are conducting these evaluations over a three-year longitudinal study. And just to reiterate that there is no measure in existence, no, not the ADOS, not the CARS, not the autism quotient, whatever you're, you're using in your research or clinical practice that diagnoses autism. Clinicians diagnose autism. It's our clinical judgment. So I am very acutely aware of the burden on my and my colleagues' shoulders when we have to give that label to an individual. For um, most of them, it stays with them for their lifetime. And so that's an excruciating process in the best of circumstances, meaning when we are 100% certain of our judgment. And what I'm going to be talking to you about today is no certainty. It's when we're looking in the crystal ball and trying to predict which infants at the age of 12 months might go on to have autism. So just understanding, again, that burden that comes with that, this is not something that we are conducting lightly. I also want to say that I'm going to quote my, my mentor and colleague, Ami Klin, we are not in the business of curing autism. What we're doing is trying to optimize outcome, identifying where in development autism is going, or development is going awry, and going awry meaning developmental delays, language delays, what will be cognitive delays, what will turn into debilitating symptoms like uh, behavioral dysregulation, self-injurious behaviors, tantruming because an individual cannot communicate and navigate a social world. So that's what we're doing. And again, to quote Ami Klin, what he says, uh, we're in the business of making autism an issue of diversity, not disability. So in that regard, please understand, in our early detection research, even when we're trying to identify biomarkers, that's our, meaning our at the Emory, um, Emory University and Marcus Autism Center, our view. And then certainly want to give a shout out to the children and families who are <laughs> dedicating three years of their life and innumerable visits to our center and our imposition in their home to move the science of autism forward. So just to um, recap, Autism in the general population is found in one in 68 individuals. Um, Catherine yesterday and other speakers so eloquently outlined the, the um, really striking gap between when we can identify autism in toddlers and when we are actually identifying autism in school-age children, and that we need to close that gap. But what I'm going to be focusing on today are high-risk individuals for autism, meaning they are biological younger siblings of a family that already has a child with autism. The chances of that subsequent child's risk for autism is now one in five, not one in 68. That's for the full disorder. Another one in five biological siblings will have shadow symptoms, some symptoms of autism, but not the full disability. And then another one in 10 will have non-autism developmental delays, language delays, cognitive delays, et cetera. So about 50% of 
biological siblings are at risk in their development in some regard, so we are watching them very, very closely clinically and for research purposes. The challenges associated with early detection um, have been well studied by this point. When we're looking at diagnosing autism in older individuals, it's easier to discern diagnostic differentiation, for example, between autism and intellectual disability. Let's say I'm evaluating a, an individual who's 10, but their mental age because of cognitive impairment is around seven. Then we're looking to see if social impairment is above and beyond what we'd expect based on the cognitive delays alone. So if that 10-year-old is functioning at a 7-year-old uh, level, but their social functioning is lower, that's more characteristic of autism. Now try doing that in a 2-year-old with global developmental delays that's functioning at or lower than a 12-month level. It's much harder to differentiate what is a social disability above and beyond the developmental and or language delays. On the flip side, for the, in, the, the infants and toddlers that don't have any delays and might actually be advanced in their development, they're probably learning to read by sight, they know their numbers and letters, they're probably reciting facts of their favorite topic that they've learned. People are thinking that they're gifted and advanced in development, which they are, and we, we want to capitalize on those strengths, but their social vulnerabilities that are emerging are being masked by their very strengths, and they won't be identified till much later. So these are the challenges that we face, not to mention um, stability of our diagnostic um, certainty. So in clinically referred samples, this has been researched that if you bring in a child who's um, been identified of having some concern and we give a diagnosis at the age of two, it's very stable if we do a reevaluation at four or even upwards to nine years of age, 80 to 90 percent diagnostic stability. But in the research that's being conducted by the Baby Sibling Research Consortium around, um, the, around North America and Europe, we are seeing that the siblings have much more complex trajectories. We could see children with pronounced symptomatology at 18 months that fades by 24 months, maybe even comes back by 36 months. We see some infants who look completely without any risk factors at, by 24 months, but suddenly by 36 months they have full-blown symptomatology and everything in between. So this, we are still learning the trajectories of the high-risk infants. And then the research on parent concerns, because again, what was so nicely outlined in the talks yesterday, parents are identifying concerns in their children very young, um, around 14 months of age. And they're going to someone very quickly and saying that they have concerns about their child. However, for the research that I'm going to talk to you about, we are trying to identify risk factors under the age of 12 months. So that's hard for us because we are identifying concerns prior to the average age of concern in a parent. The typical concerns also include deficits, impairments, lack of skills and development that 10 years ago really defined what our conceptualization of autism was. Um, but in infant siblings, for whatever reason, their profiles are much milder than their older affected siblings. And so we're not talking about deficits, rather we're talking about vulnerabilities in development. So an infant who's a younger sibling might have joint attention, shared affect, a social smile, some emerging gestures in language, but they're not robust, they're not frequent, they're not to a level that we would say is going to get them out of the realm of risk. So in clinically referred samples, interestingly, of multiplex families, so a family that just happened to have more than one child with autism in the second, um, when they're doing research and asking them about their concern of the subsequent child, they're not concerned earlier by nature of having already a child with autism. So that poses some challenges for us in the research we're doing as well. And understandably, parents with the latest concerns tend to be older and have a history of infertility treatments. We, we certainly understand that all of the struggles that go with having a child, that once you have that child, it's going to be so challenging for you to hear from any clinician um, that something might be going awry in development. 
So now to tell you about the study, it, as I said, it's an Autism Center of Excellence program project, meaning it has multiple experimental paradigms happening um, in, in one center project. Three of the paradigms are on infants at high risk and low risk for autism. So the low risk control sample, there's no autism in the, th in the family to the third degree relative. And so uh, project one right here is eye tracking. So we do eye tracking uh, 12 to 13 times in the first two years of life. We do monthly vocal recordings in the home from birth through age three. And then this is what I'm going to focus on. It's a treatment paradigm developed by Amy Weatherby called Early Social Interaction that I'll tell you about. It's a parent coaching paradigm to keep um, infants actively engaged in social development. And we're starting it at 12 months of age. We are not diagnosing 12 month olds with autism. We are just raising concern based on clinical screeners. And then there's a fourth paradigm that uh, is an analog to the eye tracking with infant rhesus monkeys. So to tell you about the paradigm, when we enroll infants into the study at birth, we are consenting them to projects one and two, the eye tracking and the vocal recordings. We cannot ethically consent them to a treatment paradigm that A, not every infant's going to be eligible for, and B, that's 12 months in the future. So we only are informing the families that this is a a potential project that they could be involved in. I have to say anecdotally that all of the parents are very excited that there is a treatment protocol as part of our study. So they're at, when they've just given birth, they're very optimistic about the treatment um, that could possibly come 12 months later. The first clinical assessment happens at nine months. And I don't, for the sake of time, have, um, I'm going to go into detail on every single experimental and clinical measure that we're using, but we are giving parent screeners, um, Amy Weatherby's infant toddler checklist and early screening for autism communication disorders. Um, these are broadband screeners, much more broadband than the MCHAT, for example, that's autism specific because we want to cast the net wide enough to get the broader phenotype. So all of the vulnerabilities in the infants, not just those with the most pronounced symptomatology. And then we are um, doing a direct speech language communication assessment called the Communication Symbolic Behavior Skills. There is a measure developed by Amy Weatherby called the SORF, the Systematic Observation of Red Flags in Autism. It's keyed into the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria, and so you're, you're on a rating scale, the clinician is um, rating symptoms of autism based on the behaviors observed during the CSBS, the Direct Communication Assessment. At nine months, we are not diagnosing any child with autism, but if we do have any concerns about language development or any type of developmental concerns, we are raising those to the parents and recommending them for our early intervention services in the state. They come back at 12 months. We, we prep them at nine months that we are going to repeat all of these measures at 12 months. In addition to repeating everything I just told you, we are doing a one hour observational video or 75 minutes in the home to get a naturalistic sampling of the child in their natural environment. That video is coded by Florida State University staff and they are using the SORF, the, the Systematic Observation of Red Flags and Autism, and doing a SORF on the home observation. Then we, in addition to the CSBS SORF and um, the, the ESAC and the Infant Toddler Checklist, we're also doing a developmental assessment using the Mullen Skills of Early Learning and an Adaptive Behavior Assessment. We give feedback if um, we have concerns about the child. Again, we are either recommending treatment services in the state and or telling them whether or not they're eligible for our treatment program. Here's our eligibility. We have... Um, Two of the four um, meeting eligibility for the treatment would involve this. A standard score of less than 70 on the communication and symbolic language skills denoting actual delays in social communication and or play or speech, um, or two subskills um, less than seven. The SORF, the red flags, there have to be eight or more one on the CSBS or one from the home observation. And then the ESAC, which is the parent report of autism and communication symptomatology. 
Of those four, two have to be um, failed, quote unquote, one of which has to be a SOAR, keying into the diagnostic criteria. So parents are informed at the 12 month visit that their child's eligible for the treatment protocol, but we are not consenting them at that time because it's overwhelming to be telling them that their 12 month old child has concerns. So we send them home with information about the study and we bring them back a few days later to consent and then enroll in the study and randomize uh, them to the, to the trial. So early social interaction is actually um, an, um, an empirical parent coaching model for toddlers in 18 to 24 months. This was published in pediatrics a couple of years ago by Amy Weatherby, Julianne Woods, and her colleagues at Florida State. It uses coaching the parent in the home to keep their child actively engaged in natural uh, occurring in, in everyday activities, bathing, dressing, feeding, playing, even out in the community. They're teaching the parents transactional supports to enhance social interaction and engagement. So for example, positioning would be a transactional support. So positioning, if you're reading to your child, many of us who are parents, we read to our infant with our infant on the lap, looking away from us while we're holding a book and we're both looking at the book. That actually does not foster social engagement. In children who go on to not have autism, they have joint attention shared affect and they will initiate turning back to their parent and, and engaging. But a child at risk for autism who's not robust in those skills, that's not the best positioning. So you turn the child at an angle, have the book over here, now you both can be looking at each other and at the book at the same time. So these are the types of things that the parents are coached on. We are not asking the parents to engage in 20 hours a week of direct therapeutic services. We're asking them to just use these transactional supports in their everyday lives. So they're randomized to either having the in-home parent coaching two times a week, plus coming to our center once a week for a parent-ed, parent-child interaction play group. The control treatment is just coming to the center once a week for that parent-ed, uh, parent-child interaction group. To date in the project, we have enrolled 209, or when I gathered it for the study, uh, for this presentation, 209 infants enrolled in the total protocol, of which 141 have aged 12 months, meaning that they're eligible for treatment, or they've aged to 12 months for eligibility. 34 have been eligible, meaning they failed at least two out of those four criteria that I told you about, 25 high risk, nine low risk and um, hi highly educated families that we have um, in our protocol right now. So I'm gonna walk you through the results that I wanna talk about because some of them pack a punch. So the, the infants eligible for treatment at 12 months, the 34, 42% um, are high risk and 11% are low risk. Now remember what I told you about the, the broader phenotype, we would expect the 40%, 20% to be at risk for autism and tw another 20% to be at risk for the, the broader symptomatology. And in the general population, about 10% of, of infants and toddlers are at risk for developmental uh, delays of some sort. So the low risk, we're getting about what we would expect. We were not expecting this. 47% of the parents of eligible infants are declining the treatment by 12 months of age. Now remember, when they consented to the study when their child was first born, they were very excited about the treatment. Now, 44% of those are high-risk parents, and they've been well-informed about the genetic risk for autism. And then um, we've had three high-risk withdraw for very understandable purposes, and then um, some of these infants have aged to diagnostic evaluations at two and three, um, four of which have been diagnosed with autism, two of which have been the infants who were eligible but their parents declined treatment. I'm not gonna go into the statistical details because we just don't have enough in each sample to be telling, but there are higher source scores in the ones who consented to treatment. And the main reasons for declining treatment were um, difficulty with really uh, their their older their older child with 
a diagnosis of autism is probably two or three. So can you imagine they're already overwhelmed in trying to get services for that child, and then they're also really not endorsing the symptomatology that we're uh, raising. So when you saw Michael Udell and then uh, Holly here, and, and Michael mentioned the task force of the bioethics, this paper has actually been critical to our thinking of what's going on in our study. So when we have the discussion, these are the thinking points and the talking points I'd like uh, to raise. About risk perception, is this um, our perception of risk? Or is it the parent's perception of risk that is something um, that's different that we were not expecting? Or is it the way we're communicating the risk to families? Do we need to be diagnosing and giving a label of autism in order for more um, parents to consent? Or is it that um, we're, we're frightening parents by raising concerns? And we have to think about false positives and false negatives. And is this really going to be a, um, a harmful treatment if we do it and we're wrong? So this raises the question of parent coaching, fostering engagement in infants, and parent-child interaction. The way I equate it to is exercise. Should exercise only be for those who already have uh, obesity, heart disease, and only a treatment and not something that's being proactive and no one else should exercise. So in that way, think about it. Would this be a good treatment to give all infants, um, especially all infants who by genetics are at risk for autism? And so um, that's something that please keep in mind when we have our discussion. So I want to thank um, our funding agencies, of which there are many, to go into this very uh, comprehensive study. So thank you so much.